going to be talking about the 18th century philosopher David Hume and his thoughts on causation. Now, by causation, we mean the relationship between two or more events. Um, and if, if there's a causal relationship, we maintain that one event happened because the other event has made it happen. Or that one event happens and another event must happen because of that first event. Or that the second event is contained within the first event in a chain of events known as a chain of causality. Or that a second event is made necessary or inevitable by the first event. Uh, we've all heard about the problem of the chicken and the egg. Well, that's an example of causality. Uh, an egg comes to be, a chicken comes to be. But did the egg cause the chicken or did the chicken cause the egg? Uh, perhaps some of you might like to blog about the answer to that or, or leave a comment on uh, in the comment section if you're watching this on YouTube. I'll come back to the answer to that question because there's a there's a, an interesting modernist answer to it, but that's causality. What comes first, the chicken or the egg? Now then, any theory of causation must involve a regression to a first cause. If you accept that there's causation, I'm going to come on to this, but David Hume argues that there is no such thing as causation in nature, um, that it's it's a mental uh, phenomena. It's a, it's a habit of mind as he calls it. But other philosophers who maintain, particularly religious philosophers or ontological philosophers, scholastic philosophers of the Middle Ages, um, are interested in the chain of regression. And the chain of regression actually forms part of the ontological proof of God, that there must have been a first event, a prime mover, as it's sometimes called, right at, back at the beginning of time, there was an event that set all other events in motion and that you can trace all events now happening, including, I suppose, this podcast and the fact that uh, if you're hearing it, ipso facto, you must be listening to it, um, that you listening to it has been caused by me making it and then it goes back and back and back and back into an infinite regression and there must have been a first cause and that first cause is God. This is a very familiar argument in favour of the existence of God, that there was a first cause, of a chain of cause, a chain of cause and effect uh, that we now observe. First cause, the first cause is God, or could be called God. It's an ontological proof of the existence of God, because to doubt the existence of God is to doubt the fact of the first cause. And, uh, and this first cause caused all subsequent events. If there was no first cause, universe cannot exist, it does exist, so that proves that God exists. Or that God existed. Um, this form of the ontological argument allows the possibility that God set the chain of causality in motion and then disappeared. Now this view of God was popular with people at the time of Hume, not Hume himself. Hume was probably uh, an atheist because um, he didn't accept causality. Therefore, he didn't need to have God, even an ontological God, to be the first cause. But the, uh, there was a view of God at the time, which was theism, known as theism, that God set the universe in motion. It's the God of the first cause, but then played no real further role in how these events unfolded very popular view with Enlightenment philosophers and scientists in the mould of Newton. And in fact, Newtonian mechanics, Newtonian physics, the law of gravity, does require something like a first mover, which is very convenient to call that first mover God. That's the view of God as the great architect of the universe or the great clockmaker. God, God is the first mover who makes all this amazing celestial clockwork in the shape of immutable laws of nature. The argument about God's a bit of a side issue for Hume anyway, because he thinks there is no causation, uh, or rather that causation doesn't exist in the physical universe. Causation 
only happens in our minds when we're attributing uh, the process of one thing causing an another. The issue about God is really a bit of a side issue for Hume. It's worth dwelling on it for a moment though because we are going to look at Immanuel Kant uh, pretty much next in this series. Kant has to bring God back in again because Kant wants there to be causality um, in the universe. But for Hume, there is no ca causality in the physical universe. All that causality is, is a habit of mind or an imaginative activity by we humans uh, as we observe uh, the world. Now this mental process of attributing cause uh, is called induction. Now, I mentioned in my first lecture in the HCJ series, week one, uh, something about logic uh, when we were discussing Aristotle and the inheritance from the classical Greek world of the Renaissance and the Enlightenment. And we looked there very briefly, if you look back in your notes, at Aristotle's uh, logic and discussing uh, logic in general, there are two types of logic you might also call ways of thinking or reasoning processes. Mind doesn't just work at random, according to Aristotle anyway. Um, uh, there are disciplined forms of thinking and the framing problems that, that uh, are necessary to have any type of understanding at all. First of these is deductive logic um, or analytic logic. One problem we have with this is that various philosophers at various times use very closely similar words, uh, or different words with very similar meanings for the same thing. So there's analytic logic or deductive logic. It means the same thing. It means logic which derives a truth statement or a conclusion from the original term. So just to give you an example of that, a deductive or analytic, analytical logical proposition is something like all bicycles have two wheels. Um, the conclusion about the number of wheels is contained in the original proposition because if the bicycle had three wheels it'd be a tricycle if it had one wheel it'd be a monocycle so that is you can deduce from the fact that something is a bicycle that it will have two wheels and that will always be true analytical logic is true by definition um, it's truth preserving it's very useful in that way not very useful in terms of scientific speculation, that's the point, it's, it's conservative. Another example of uh, deduction is uh, all bachelors are unmarried. Uh, you, know, you can draw the conclusion that if a person is a bachelor uh, that uh, he will have no wife. So that's deductive uh, logic. Uh, so that's Deductive logic, analytical logic, analytical, more modern word. It means to uh, analyze, to break down, to um, take something, chop it up into constituent things, similar to psychoanalysis, where you're breaking down the personality of somebody, see what, see uh, what it's made of, uh, or chemical analysis, where you're literally in a laboratory chopping up physical stuff and finding out what it's made of. So that's analytical logic. Or deductive logic. But this talk is mainly concerned with synthetic logic or inductive logic. Synthesis is the opposite of analysis. It's building things up from more 